Okay, we are in Hebrews 10th chapter, and we have been looking at uh, verse 8, and we're going back in verse 7 that Christ came to do God's will, or the will of the Father. Uh, in verse 8, that it's a quote from what David had said, and Psalms, the that he came to do the will of God, but uh, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and and uh, burnt offerings for sin, God did not have pleasure in them from the standpoint that they could not take away sin, but that God had prepared a body for him, and thus uh, the sacrifice that. Uh, comes from that uh, that physical body. It's a sacrifice that is what God wanted in relationship to Christ, how that, that sacrifice would be his death upon the cross through which he would have pleasure in the sense that there would be a total forgiveness of sins. So verse 9 then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Christ came to do God's will. And in doing so, uh, he took away the Old Testament, the old law, so that the new law could come into existence. This really, in verse 9, is the conclusion of what he has been saying in the previous verses. The removing of the old law, the establishing of the new law. The sacrifices <coughs> that were of the Old Testament were given based upon the law. Uh, you could not have the sacrifices without the law of Moses. The law of Moses became the basis of those sacrifices in the Old Testament. And so he ties these two inseparably together, sac the sacrifices and the law. But those sacrifices could not take away sin. Something else was needed. And... Thus, for Christ's sacrifice to be a full sacrifice in the taking away of sins, there had to be another law that was established. You could not have the old law and have the sacrifice of Christ because the Old Testament sacrifices were based upon the law. Thus, the sacrifice of Christ had to be based upon the law. But it could not be the old law had to be a new law. Uh, and so that new law had to be established, and that's why you, the point is here. We'll come back to this, but I just want to mention it here. In relationship to those who would try to go back under the old law, uh, whether you're dealing with the Ten Commandments, whether you're dealing with the moral aspect of the law, anytime you try and go back to any parts of the law, you're denying the sacrifice of Christ because the sacrifice of Christ is based upon the new law. That's basically what the criminal legal system anticipates doing. Well, they, they do, yes. They, at least some uh, some elements of premillennialism teach the going back into the Old Testament law. The word take away here that he taketh away the first, is a Greek word that means to remove, to abolish, or to abrogate. Uh, it can mean to get rid of by execution, uh, to destroy. And actually it's spoken of or used in relationship to public executions. <laughs> But here, within the meaning of it, would be the taking away or the removing, the abrogating of that law. 
the word that he may establish the second. The word establish there is a Greek word which means to cause to stand or to place. Uh, one Lex can put it to cause to be in a place or position. Set, place, bring, allow to come, and then to set up or put in force, force, establish. So that's the way in which uh, one Lex can defines this word. It is to set up or to put in force. You take out of force one to put in force another one. And so that's what was taking place. <clears throat> Verse 10 then, we are sanctified by the offering of Christ. Uh, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ, Jesus Christ once for all. By the which will. What is that will? New Testament. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will. What is it? That second will. The already second got, testament. Back in the Hebrews 9, 15, That's he's tying it back in specifically to verse nine, but yes, that goes back to Hebrews nine, fifteen through seventeen. Um, it is a, the word here is he's dealing with a testament by the which will. What is it? That testament that he's dealing with. Uh, it's the will of God that Christ came to do in establishing the, the Second Testament, or the New Testament. Sanctified, by the which will we are sanctified, is a Greek word uh, which means to set apart for God. It is applied as being free of sin and dedicated. And I'm going because of time, I'm not going to elaborate on that, but um, as the use here we've talked about, and hopefully you can remember, what is the perfect tense? Past action with continuing results. Okay. Or past action or completed action sometimes, point action with completed or continuing results. That's the tense that is used here. It is a, actually a perfect passive participle. Say that real quick a few times. <laughs> perfect passive participle. Um, indicates that he has been sanctified and continues to be sanctified. What does he? What's he referring to? By the which will we are sanctified. How are we sanctified? And what's specifically the reference sanctified dealing with here? I said it's applied in two different ways. Which way is it being applied here? Sprinkling the blood of the Old Testament is contrasted with the greater results of sprinkling Christ's blood. Ties in the First Peter one two. How is it being used here then? I don't know the, the grammar. <laughs> I, you're the one that knows that, but I can't remember it. No, don't need grammar in this. No. No. It's the application. Okay. It's applied in two different ways. It's applied through in relationship to being free of sin. It's applied in the aspect of being dedicated or consecrated. Which way is it being applied here? De not dedicated, not specifically. It might have a secondary aspect of that, but it's primarily dealing with the forgiveness of sins, being freed of our sins. And so, Dale, you were right, you just didn't complete it, the thought. Oh. It's being freed of sin. It, that's what sets us apart. Uh, but what sets us apart here? Hmm? 
well, being without sin, but what is it that sets us apart? What is it? It says, by the rich will we are sanctified. By the blood. By the blood. Sacrificing. Let's look, look at the context. By the which will he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified. There you go. The New Testament. The New Testament. Well, we'll get to that. Um, but yes, it is. But it's the, the Testament, that will of God. That Second Testament. Now, what's the blood of Christ based on? Well, the Testament, the law. Just as the old law became the basis of the Old Testament sacrifices, the new law becomes the basis for the New Testament sacrifice of Christ. Now, by that will, that New Testament, that new law, we are sanctified. What is it? We're made free of sin. Now, you understand how he's dealing with it? Now, does that have an application to our being dedicated? Yes, but it's not really being, it's not really in the picture here. It is that first application. We are freed from our sins based upon the law of Christ, which is the basis of that sacrifice of Christ. Um, so we are sanctified in the New Testament. Uh, something just to point out here as well. Because he mentions we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ, I thought we were saved by the blood of Christ. Uh, through through his going to the cross. Uh, his, his sacrifice, you know, his, his, his blood, his, his body, his life. What well, is it? His blood or his body? <laughs> well, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the point is that I'm getting to the term body and blood are being used interchangeably within the scriptures you talk about the body of Christ you're talking about the blood of Christ you talk about the blood of Christ you're talking about the body of Christ so the body of Christ is the first part of the Lord's Supper it's two well, I was going to make an application to the Lord's Supper, his body and his blood, while you're dealing with you're dealing with the same thing basically and essentially. Um, so we are saved by his body or by his blood. Um, now, what is that? That's that body that God had prepared for him. And why he says Thou hast prepared a body for me. Lo, I come to do thy will. A body thou hast prepared for me. And this is that body that God had prepared for him. The word once here, through the offering of the body of Christ once, and you see for all is italicized. I'm not sure that that should be italicized there. Um, the Greek word literally means once for all. That is the meaning of it. But it refers here to Christ and his offering. As opposed to those Old Testament sacrifices that had to be offered every year, Christ's body was offered once for all time. It did not have to be continually offered. And we've emphasized that in previous times, so won't uh, go back over that too much. So verses 11 through 18, the full and absolute forgiveness. And in verses 10 or 11 and 12, the old priest stood offering daily Christ, though set down after his offering. Um, and so we have in verse 11, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. Uh, 
really you need to draw a line between the word standeth here and set down in verse 12 because there's a contrast that is there. Where, where, what now? Standeth in verse 11? And set down in verse 12. There's, there's the contrast. Standeth indicates that their work was never finished. They still had work to do. Why? Because the sacrifice they offered couldn't take away sins. Uh, and thus, they continued to stand. Well, verse 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. The word man actually, but this man is, the word man's not in the original. It's literally this one. Um, so, but the application is not to man, but it refers back to the priest of verse 11. So, so you make that point. Jesus didn't have to do like the old priest did, in other words, is what he's, like the point he's making. All those years, the hundreds of years. Well, you could read it, verse 11 and 12. Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this priest, that's the what he's getting to. But this priest, as opposed to those priests, it's not this man. Was he a man? Yes, he took on human flesh. But that's not the emphasis here. This priest. He's dealing in this section with the priesthood of Christ. So this priest, um, he sat down as opposed to stands. And so I uh, said already those two are, we see the comparison there. He was able to sit down because in offering sacrifice for sins, his work was completed. It was finished. There wasn't anything else to do. Um, now then, he sat down because that work of sacrificing for sins was complete. The priest stood because it didn't. But the aspect of sitting down also ties in with something else. Go back to chapter 1 in verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. Now what did we talk about that? It's dealing with. What is the purging of our, of our sins? By, he had by himself purged our sins. He was doing what? It's the sacrifice on the when died and was resurrected. He, nice. Put it a different one. He was serving in what office? As a priest. As priest. There you go. That's dealing with his priesthood. Then he goes on, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now what does that have reference to? What office? Kingship. When we come over here now then, well, skip down to verse 8 and you see it again. But the Son, he hath said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. So he's dealing with kingship there. Uh, and also see this in Colossians 3 and verse 1. Um, and let me just bring, mention that one from the standpoint. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. What is it? Long after the this was uh, the establishment of the second law, he's still sitting, isn't he? 
So he didn't sit and then get up and sit and so forth. Um, we don't have time, but uh, study Acts the second chapter, specifically verses thirty through thirty-four. Zechariah six and verse thirteen. Psalm 110, verses 1 and 2, then 4 and 5. Psalm 1 and 2, then 4 and 5. In all of these verses, he links priesthood with kingship. So, I probably should have tried to do this early, before class, but uh, I'm not sure how it's going to work out, but we're going to try. Uh, Paul links the sitting down with his... Um, with being on the throne of God, his kingship in these verses uh, that we I just referred to. Uh, in chapter one, if you refer if you remember back in our study of chapter one, he linked kingship with sonship. So being the son of God. Remember that discussion? He ranks sonship with being high priest. Remember, this day have I begotten thee to do what? To be a priest in the sacrifice that he offered. Um, and so the high priesthood or its priesthood to the sacrifices that he offered. And by which those sacrifices he sat down on the throne to be king. <clears throat> and all of this, well, is being high priest. All of these things are based upon what? All, all, all of it shows he's a prophet that replaced Moses. Um, mm, that's not what we're dealing with here, though. What do we see in verse 9? You mean 1-9 or... Ten nine. Ten nine. Oh. Doing the establishment of the new. Why? Because the sacrifices were based upon the law. Thus, the taking away of the first, the establishing of the second. All of these things are based upon the New Testament. Now then, let's emphasize the point a little bit. And yes, for all of these things to take place, the old law had to be taken away, the new law had to be established. Now, what about someone, and I said we'd come back to this, who wants to go back to, say, the Ten Commandments? Well, you're following the grace questions, 5-4. You are denying the kingship of Christ. Also, premillennialists deny the kingship of Christ today. Denying they sing down at the right hand of God, his kingship, his sonship, his priesthood, the sacrifice that he offered. You're denying in reality all of those things because all of those things are linked together and they're all based upon the taking away of the first that he may establish the second. 
Thus, may I also emphasize person, you know, talking about instrumental music. And what's uh, generally the about the first uh, defense that they give? David used it. What? What is that? They have denied the kingship of Christ. His, they sing down at the right hand of God his kingship, his sonship, his priesthood, and his sacrifices. Now they might not realize it. They don't realize what they've done. But they've denied all of these things. They've denied the sacrifice of Christ. They've denied that he's high priest. Why? Because it's based upon the law. And they're trying to go back to that old law and all of these things are based upon law. Also, we're told not, not to add to or take from God's words so they're doing that simultaneously. Well, I don't, I, right now I don't care about that. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of things we could say about it, but it, that, it doesn't deal with this. And this is what we're dealing with right now. Um, but yes, they do those things. They need to, and people, we need to realize as well, all of these things are based upon the law of, the, of Christ. You cannot have any of this without the law. And any time you deny the law of Christ to go back un under Old Testament law, you denied these things. Or you've taken them out of the way you've rejected them. Uh, so it's a, a serious thing in which to do. Then he says uh, here in verse uh, 12, after this man, after he had, but this man or this priest would be more applicable, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. The word forever there. As you look at it, it could apply to one of two things. Maybe it applies to both, who knows. First, the offering of one sacrifice. Or it could refer to the Messiah sitting down at the right hand of God. Either one of them is true. Now, which one does it apply to specifically? It's hard to determine from a grammar standpoint. Our English translators applied it primarily to the one offering of sin. Uh, but from what I understand uh, from Greek grammar, uh, it could apply to either one. Uh, does Greek, Greek grammar have endings as a tie together factor? Uh, and English has uh, as a different way of tying together in Greek. I mentioned that last week, I think. Um, but it's, in this regard, it has reference, or it would have reference to what does it apply to, what does it go back to. And it could go to either one. Um, so, but you have a situation, either one of them is, would be accurate. Whether you're dealing with the Christ sitting down at the right hand of God, he did that forever. And he and that was point of Colossians 3.1, even after the law was established, he's still sitting at the right hand of God. Or it could refer to that one sacrifice that he made. It was done forever. So it could, it could apply to either one. Verses 13 and 14 then, Christ's sacrifice perfects those who are sanctified. Um, he says, From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstools. For by one offering hath he perfected them, or perfected forever them that are sanctified. He rules <coughs> expecting his enemies to be made his footstool is what he's setting it forth in verse 13. From henceforth, when, when he's sitting down at the right hand of God, when he is king, what is he expecting? He is expecting his enemies to be made his footstool. 
So he is on the throne at the same time that he is expecting this. Okay, Dale? And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, okay. uh, I was going to bring that up, that uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 25, and 26, last enemy being destroyed is death. He is ruling, expecting that, till his enemies are made his footstool. And again, you could tie in Psalm 110 and verse 1, and Acts 2 and verse 35. But you have to understand, both of them at the same time. He is ruling while he is expecting his enemies to be made his foot sore. What was that second one? Psalm 110 and what was the other second one? Uh, Acts 2.35. Oh, okay, thank you. Now then, he rules till his enemies are made his foot sore. The word till is a, a time element. Gives a time frame that this is going to take place till this happens. Um, and so he is continuing to rule, expecting this. In verse 14, notice there's four things that are set forth here. First, by one offering. That's going to be his death on the cross the body that he offered, the blood that he offered as a sacrifice for sins, that one-time offering. So by one offering, that's first. Second, he hath perfected. We'll, I'll come back to this word perfected. Third, them that are sanctified. That's third thing. And then fourth, forever. Now, so those are your four points in this verse. Somebody wants a sermon sometime, there's your four-point sermon. <laughs> but the, somebody said a long time ago it's supposed to be three points and a point. <laughs> I never did learn that, though. <laughs> uh, but here's four points. There's those four points. So go back. By one offering, mention his death on the cross. He hath perfected. The word perfected, what does it mean? Sinlessness? No, it means completed or made mature. Okay. To bring to a state of completion. What is the completed state that he's talking about here? For by one offering he hath perfected. He's brought to completion. What is he brought to completion? Go ahead and say it. No. Uh, the Christian race are alive? No. The, the state of the believer. The salvation of the believer. He's perfected them that are sanctified. So, he's brought to a state of completion. In other words, give them full remission of sins. That's, sins. That is the whole point, yes. Okay. He's given them full, total, complete forgiveness of sins. In other words, like they're dead it's, they're sin like a baby, in other words. It is not like the old sacrifices, which had to be offered yearly, and thus the forever part here, not yearly sacrifices, but one offering for sacrifice for forever. Goes back, could be to verse 10, also chapter 8 and verse 12. Both that, that, uh, that prophecy of uh, Jeremiah. And we're going to see, he ties in the prophecy of Jeremiah in the next couple of verses. That makes me think of Daniel being like a hand in the flesh like a little child. Uh, well, <laughs> okay. The he's going to tie in the prophecy of Jeremiah in the next couple of verses, and that prophecy is their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. 
So what is it? He's perfected. He's brought it to a state of completion. Them that are sanctified was the third part. This word sanctified, again, primarily dealing with freedom from sin within this context. It might embrace that aspect of being dedicated, but again, the very basic meaning is one who is set apart for God. Here, primarily, freedom from sin. And that takes us back to, again, verse 10. So, by the one offering, he has brought to a state of completion those individuals who have been made free from sin forever, not yearly. Ten and fourteen go together. Tie together. Uh, yes, they do in many respects. Verse fifteen through eighteen. Then Jeremiah testifies of the perfected sacrifice. Wherefore, or whereof the Holy Ghost also is witness to us that after after that he has said before. And there's a couple points I want to make about verse 15. Turn back to Jeremiah 31, and specifically verse 31. What does it state there? Let the days come that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. 3131 Saith who? Saith the Lord What is that there? No, no. Jehovah, that's what I wanted. Remember, reward with all caps or small caps is Jehovah. So here, in Jeremiah, the Lord said it, who, or Jehovah said it. Here, the Holy Spirit said it. Now, first point that we want to make about this is this shows inspiration. What inspiration is. The Lord said it, or the Holy Spirit said it, but Jeremiah was the penman. But, but it's the Holy Spirit's work. That's a verbal inspiration for sure right there. As is seen many times in this book. Second thing, want to point out is what does this make the Holy Spirit? Make the Holy Spirit tied in with Jehovah. No, not tied in with Jehovah. They're one. They're one. He is Jehovah. Yeah, yeah. He is Jehovah. But the, the Jehovah is a name that's just like the name God when we see Jehovah, we should think of all three of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Here he is showing the Holy Spirit is Jehovah. Now other passages, you can see where Jesus is Jehovah. Or the Christ, or the second person of the Godhead. In other places, we would see that the Father is referred to as Jehovah. So, here, though, Holy Spirit. Uh, yet there are some things that the Father knows the Son don't. Matthew 24, 36, he gets all of them in mind with you. Okay. You know? uh, here, the Holy Ghost is a witness to these things. Or Jehovah is a witness to them. God is. But here, specifically, the Holy Spirit is a witness to the things that he's discussing. 
uh, verses 16 and 17 then, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And this again is a quotation from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Also repeated in Hebrews the 8th chapter, verses 8 through 13. But he deals with the specific part of that prophecy that he that is he is dealing it with within this context, which is God will remember their sins no more. Why? Because he has brought them to perfection, verse 14. He's brought them to completion. And the sacrifice in regards to the forgiveness of sins by that one offering. So, now then, we can make the point, in quoting Jeremiah here, he places the Jews in an unenviable position. Because what's the purpose of the book? What's taking place? Um, the doing away with the old law and, 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 and the new law, establishing that, uh, that Jesus is the high priest. Well, but the entire of the book, entirety of the book's purpose is to convince these Jews not to leave Christ because they were on the verge of going back into Judaism. And now then he's saying, if you go back into Judaism, you've denied your own prophet. Jeremiah prophesied of this. And so if you're going to accept Jeremiah, you've got to accept Jesus. If you accept Jeremiah, you've got to accept the sacrifice that Jesus made. Or else, if you don't accept Jesus, you've rejected Jeremiah. You've rejected your own prophet. So we'll start with verse 18 next week.